My first poem tonight is entitled, O to a Warrior. How do you stand all the blood that's been shed? How can you handle the pain? Sweat is pouring from your head. We just open our umbrellas. Okay, now, <clears throat> I've changed the wording on this, so I'm going to have to read it word for word uh, from my uh, thing rather than uh, go by it. Now, I'm going to uh, start this poem again because I kind of blew it. Starting again, O to a Warrior. How can you stand all the blood that's been shed? How do you handle the pain? Sweat is pouring from your head. We just open our umbrellas. War takes its toll on everyone, a fact not one soul debates. Your armor shimmers in the sun, your golden sword awaits. Against his shield your sword does bound, wrist jerk with every blow. Small bits of shield float to the ground. We merely shovel our sidewalks. Crushing blows from crudels fall, they make your armor ring. You hate your enemy proud and tall, you fight with all your bing. Fingers are cramped, muscles are sore, your foe shaking and pale. Your gasps for breath sound like a roar. We just fly our kites. At last you strike a, fit, a lethal blow. The birds are taking wing. Thanks to you it's the end of ice and snow. We just say it's spring. <laughs> and with this crazy weather I thought that was pretty apropos. <laughs> now this next one is called 1am. Resurrected leaves handspring across the meadow drawing the couple closer still. Locked eye to eye in spiritual intercourse as they talk at 1 a.m. A most dangerous time when mouths and defenses are wide open. Now this, this one is about the same girl I just wrote about in 1 a.m. It's called Portrait. A silhouette at twilight, elusive she bides her time and waits for night, passing quietly through growing darkness. The moon illuminates her soft features. An artist removing crushed velvet to reveal her masterpiece. A portrait of wisdom and wonder. Now this next poem is uh, something that I've been doing for quite some time on the Philadelphia circuit and since there have been uh, there are some new people here I'm going to be performing this one again uh, for the benefit of those who have not heard it before this is called Lioness <clears throat> and this is um, a piece that doesn't interpret well on paper it's got to be performed you have your mate but not your match for you have no equal you are beyond compare you stand fearless, bold, unapproachable, majestic, eyes, teeth, glittering, fur illuminated by midday sun. You are invincible, beyond mercy, beyond pain. Lioness! A brush wind heralds your regal presence. The reverent wind whispers as the grass bows low before you. You gaze brazenly about as none dare meet your eyes. Your mouth opens wide and from your throat escapes a <coughs> whimper. Confusion, lioness. It's confusion, not you that reigns supreme. Your facade of greatness crumbles, lioness, as you reveal your wounds. Deep, jagged wounds, reminders of gut-wrenching pain. Hideous, crusted wounds, reminders of battles lost. Oh, Lioness, moans the pitying wind. Poor, poor Lioness. Leaves nod in sad agreement. Pay them no mind, Lioness. Your scars make you all the more beautiful. <laughs> now this one is about the death of my grandmother. Cell, copy self, again and again, continues the chain of life. Such are the ways of nature, such are the ways of life. Those cells are attacked, their defense successful, just as nature deemed it would. It follows the rules of nature, so it follows that it is good. 
Those cells grow and multiply, though they live in constant strife. It follows the rules of nature. It follows the rules of life. Those cells become a dominant force. How those cells abound. There are cycles in nature. In life, they can also be found. Alpha and Omega and Z. Those cells were called cancer. Their host is now dead. For such are the ways of nature, and such is the way of death. <sighs> this poem I did today, or yesterday actually. It's called Piano Practice. Delicate finger, uh, okay, here it goes. Piano Practice. Delicate icicles, brown, dangle from fingertips, peanut butter. Time for the lady with a strange smell and stranger voice. S mm, polished walnut, inches from off-white wallpaper. Square, sturdy hands placed firmly on the keyboard. Small, scrubbed hands splayed across smooth, gleaming ivory. Hands land in unison, occasionally. He's still young, missus. Fill in the name of your favorite pianist. Now, <laughs> this is... This is... Okay? Time okay? Okay. Alright. This is uh, a poem called Cannibal. And uh, this is a poem that I wrote when I was a bit depressed. <laughs> it goes like this. He must feed off the thoughts of others, or devour himself, by reaching inward, ever inward, till he sucks out his brain, gagging on clumps of self. I was not in a good mood when I wrote that. And thank you. I banged this against the chair without realizing it, but it was six minutes. All right, will you help me welcome, please, Bob Small? Being it's Thanksgiving, I have a couple of any thanksgiving poems. These are from last year, but kind of like them. <clears throat> One's just called Payday. Uh, they're both about the same girl. I bought myself a new lighter. Would have bought a new lover, but you weren't on sale today. And Thanksgiving. I thought of you on Thanksgiving, being you weren't here like you was once, hearing about you're there, the hymn whom you're humming with, whose mother sits and rocks and reads the Bible, King James Revised on the first floor, while you inject uncut pieces of him into your veins like I once did you, having gone cold turkey from you, having drunk great big gobbler gobs of wild turkey from you, having felt like the prime turkey, turkey number one from you, from the lack of you, I thought to be giving my turkey thanks that you don't have me to kick and bite and love around in your inimitable way of showing I was just another face till you found the right one again. But come New Year's Eve, I'm really gonna party. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> that's from 112782. And I think that's the first time I got it right. Uh, I'm going to read one poem. <clears throat> I'm going to read one poem from Heat, who <clears throat> really have good editorial judgment. They put one of my poems in. Okay. Uh, listen to the, the title here, it like, reveals it all. It's, it's called Young King Lear. You are the laughing winds on this latest in a series of bridges I try to walk across. You are the scandal sun, the unsandaled moon gazing passionate disinterest as I seek to locate feelings prehensile feelings pre-life the other side where the concrete ends one you are the sarcastic rain that nips and bites knifes down even on blind men the rain of sliced memory and diced misunderstanding the fey rain dropping scattered truths not be calm but become chunk pieces of scalding almost wishes almost wases Thundering memories, illuminating with the quick bang flash. Nothing at all. Falling every which place. The place of me that wishes you to shower your gold upon me. Two, I would love to taste your shower, be delicious at your mercy, or see you not at all. If I could only creep my way through your fog. Would love the feel of your pellets of wetness. As a sign from you, not mark stop, do not pass, do not go. Would love to feel moist bullets of your love. Would love to lick your waters. 
lick your tributaries, be under your thunder, you would know then you are a cancer. My sign is yield. I would know by your frightening lightning that I am more than just the least of your worries. 3. I need you to rain upon me with sweet, wet anger. I respect your synonyms. Cover me with the laver of your lust. Rain upon me, woman, not with distant words and half-feigned signs, not with the new spice of old desires, but with every all of you you can blister out. <coughs> in the painting, I do not cross the bridge, but stand in stare at, in the half-rain at something that must be further even than the sun, never ever to really go the one step further. I was going to try to catch your eye and say, hey, slow down. But no, I'm sure you should have slowed down. Okay. But no, I don't want to sound negative. Since the last time he read here, he's improved considerably. It comes along clean, clear, crisp. All right. Laurie Shoulder Can I go a little bit later? Can you go a little bit later? I was expecting a friend to stop Oh, I see. Okay. All right, I'll keep that in mind. But remind me, I'm not supposed to forget you. Is there a Jonathan Goodman here? Yes. Will Jonathan read, please? Will you help me welcome Jonathan? Don't trip over that. I can't afford it. This is a poem I wrote a, number, a while back ago. Uh, We're not moving. And I've heard how the severed hands of Victor Hara rooted themselves into the earth and performed gestures of supplication. It took the police a full week to dig them out of the ground. And then they say the blood stains of George Jackson's bullet pocked body were unerasable. They had to repaint the walls. But there seems to be a faint red glow behind the white gloss. No one seems to understand this. And the newspapers reported how Pablo Neruda's library burst into flame spontaneously when his books had heard of the death of Allende. The legend in the photograph. This is uh, based on a poem, I mean rather, a photograph by a man named Edward Curtis who took photographs of the Indians late in the 19th century. The legend in the photograph. On November 10th, 1939, Joe Fireheart posed for a photograph. He brought two black horses, each with a white star on its forehead, one with a wound on its side. The day was cold and all the leaves had fallen. The trees were dark skeletons and trampled hay covered the ground. The sky met the hill abruptly. It was not a day to be posing for a photograph, but the man stood there in his rough jacket and waited. He thought, the time will come when I won't have anything to do once the snow falls. It will be beautiful then to watch the grass grow white. With this in mind, he turned to the camera and he kept a thought to himself. He gazed back, smiling at the small glass lens. Um, what else? This is a poem about Dante, Descent. It was the aging Dante, not the younger man, who knew the hardship and the worth of words. He considered silence an endless virtue. He guided his speech as if words were fate. Still, nothing spoken could describe the many worlds of his longing, fate clinging to him, shaping his features as the wind and the sun shaped the outlying pattern of land. And when he took upon himself the task of a descent, he did so with nothing but light above him. 
his single thought to retrieve ascent from the world of the dead. He drove his spirit underground, beneath hills suddenly dark and green with new rain. He confronted there the dead rising to greet him with no visible sign of fear. He did not turn or hesitate. He shook the hand of everyone. Many were astonished at the sight of a man still quick with breath. Crowding around him, they demanded the news of those who loved them and whom they loved in return. Attempting to answer each, he took pride in a quiet demeanor. He satisfied those whom he could. Later, when he made his way again to the world, nothing remained of the visit but a trace of paleness and a certain ring to his words. This is a poem about a muse, this journey. What does my right foot know that my left does not? This journey to be repeated as if it had been undertaken before leaves its marks of distinction as carelessly as Helen might have left her shift on the floor. Dreams and possessions are one and the same, as are these skies and the golden thighs of a girl whose mouth still lingers in mind, whose almond eyes mute even the sea, from which I have returned as from the depths of the sea. Let this muse disdain all epithets except to be bright-eyed, every compliment returned to the giver of praise, that he may render useful all ungathered light, that truth drive him like a scourge. From island to island, the bemused gods wondering at his unshaken fury, at his pride. This is a, I don't know time-wise what I've got, but I'd like to read one semi-long poem. It's, I mean, semi, it's a number of uh, seven, seven line stanzas. It's called The Place of Waters. Were your paradise to falter, to terminate, were the will of the gods be to render you suddenly useless, who thought to have called the very sky and stars your own, would memory then be a thing to be hated, its endless repetition eroding your past, like a sea cutting into the shoreline. What, there, what love there is tells its story by means of the blue light of the sea. Sorrow is truly a thing of the past. Let the mirror go blank before the truth of the ancient light of birds. Let the heavens themselves dissolve before the image of a pair of hands. No simple serenity can stand. I call out that the snow that is still to come is indistinguishable from the pursuit of the water's resistance to the hand, that every line of the hand is a path with an ending and purpose, even should that path be rebuffed or abandoned. I call out that the coolness of a lake at the end of summer is joined to the smoothness of a stone polished by the continuous action of water that the dark green of the trees, so similar to the green of the lake, yields only to the truth of water. To be useful, to continue a journey without mythology or wings, to bathe in the perfect fire of our unknowing is to return to a life as guileless as the song of light on a tree, as the gaze of the passerby in love with time. Take the thread of heaven in your hand. The feel of it is neither coarse nor fine, yet its simplicity diminishes grandeur. It need not hold you in any way except in so far as you wish to be known to a sky above a lake in the last week of August to the dark green of its woods. Who among us has never been wounded? has never fallen in the dust of his days. I call out that the waters yearn to reach the condition of light, that the voice of love has assumed the sound of water on stone until the path of water on stone reads like a map 
of the hand. Thank you, Jonathan, for a beautiful job. You will forgive me the interruptions in compensation there who have I allowed you a couple of minutes over. All right? Helen Coleman? Yes. Please. When I have one minute left, will you raise your hand because I want to end with some haiku? Okay. Very good idea. Thank you. Please. One minute. Reservations. My true feelings left before dawn to await the shade. My honest emotions went south for the winter and may learn to love it there. This cloak of distance and anger suits the times. Have your own damn brains for dinner. Reservations. Untitled. Help me write a careful poem. Careful so as not to upset the political prisoner trapped for the purity of free thought. Easy, no need to awaken the infant whose color at birth made him obsolete. Softly, we will not shake the aged from their sparse meals. Lower, the poor might hear of eternal poverty. Come, let us join to create a poem with enough, with enough meaning to unite that which is just in this world. For the artists, for the artists. America is unkind to her artists, for she pushes them in mud puddles, throws them in bed without supper, forces them to read by the light of the moon, send rabbit dogs to tear their mended socks, tries to sell them crack rose-colored glasses. Artists, be on the lookout for darts and roots to your mailboxes. America flatten well-worn tires, put cobwebs beneath their pillows, places tacks in their favorite writing chairs, make trips to mothers infrequent but needy, snares the dancers' tights, rob them of their crackers while they rehearse, beat them to the thrift shop, coat their music sheets with bird droppings. One artist complained of ashes in his soup, soup. another um, soaked at having spitballs thrown in his bath. Perhaps America is unkind to her artists, for we are reluctant to clean her artillery. Uh, I am in love with him. I am in love with him. I wink my eyes at him. He thinks allergy. I stroke my shoulders at him. Rattle my head. He thinks some chill. I perch my lips at him. He thinks I am frail. I am in love with him. I stroke my ears. He thinks I itch. Put that romantic look in my eyes. He brings me a cup of coffee. I coo and sigh when he wanders close to me. He asks of indigestion. I try <laughs> tapping the floor to send the message. He whispered tight shoes. I am in love with him. Stress all of my syllables when I talked. He pronounced ridiculous. <laughs> Became sophisticated with my walk. He thinks it's a new dress. I purposely fell at his feet. He practically stepped on me. I am in love with him. Tried to engage in small talk. He wanted to know if I was to the right or left of politics. <clears throat> Straightened his tie and became close. I thought he said dandruff. I am in love with him. Complained of the temperature, hoping he would suggest something cozy. Of course, he felt fine. I am in love with him, but I am slowly changing my mind. <laughs> Nature. No, a poem for Granny. One day I dressed in Sunday's lace, then ran in sh and then ran shouting, Oh, Granny, see? But Mother stopped me at her door, saying, Slow down, my little bee. Soon up into her arms I went, as we began moving away from the room where Granny often stirred, though not a sigh she gave that day. Mother explained the stillness there. Deeply against the truth I wept would take my dolls and comb their hair beside the bed where she once slept. A breeze had blown my granny free of life's tiring and mortal wing to settle her about the hill where daisies bloom fine in spring. Her face and manner lingers well, as if she stood today quite clear. But only to a mound do I whisper, Oh, granny, I'm here. 
for point for granny. Nature. A braceless glitter quickly fades whenever the eyes are drawn away. No motion done and all of earth becomes anointed by the sun's ray. With talented hands, a builder might create structures quite grand to see. But louder cheer will him surround if there he adds a little tree. A doctor's notion soothes and aids the body limp lying knowing pain. Yet pure and sleepy ease admits then lingers from the fall of rain. Instruments offer notes that do arouse the mind, and rushing it attends. Such clamor sum summons anxious moods, unlike those chords strung by the wind. Each breath shall make a final sigh, and glory wreath may paint the door, but higher held is any soul whose bones indent the ocean's floor. Nature. A love letter. My pen is shaking, for these lines to no fine meaning will commit. Perhaps the words will pour as wine, if only you will come and sit. This dwelling slowly rots, and I am not concerned with its repair. Then why today and yesterday did I arrange and fluff your chair? Wallpaper peels at every turn. This table rocks on legs of three. But looking into each other's eyes, how can such things we ever see? No velvet carpet softens steps that creak about this wooden floor. Please hasten them. Allow your name to rattle at that old front door. I lay down on a bottle bed. Someone quite well this pity knew. Tonight my limbs remain restless, waiting the warm contour of you. When time proves selfish and pull me weeping from this tiny room, say goodbye to all mortal friends and quickly join me in my tomb. School days. Schooling provided a useful grace, although to scarcely I did care about the sciences, grammar, math, and other studies offered there. But kindly nature gave the shell a very peaceful, clever eye, behind a mask of reason keen, affording less the need to try. The constant ploys with friends made all the days seem tranquil and serene. Before that chant, open your books, was heard, then chased away the dream. Some notes were passed of secrets new, taking my mind from classroom bore, until sweetly the bell alarm, concluding learning's phase once more. An inner flame enshrined those days, as often I recall the bliss of being there day after day, always denying time his kiss. But he would soon have it, and I to him became joyously wed, because of a promise to care for me, even when I am dead. School days. Okay, I want to end with some haiku. It's a I have a passion for writing haiku, and 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 uh, uh, all of these that I'm going to read have appeared in like Dragonfly Quarterly the Haiku and some modern haiku. And you know, Japanese uh, haiku is a Japanese poem, three lines. Okay, always about nature. Bitter cold, and consoling the boy, my cold hands. Facing the spring moon, she speaks of her son having died so soon. Stifling heat, farm boys in the melon patch, their bare backs. February sun, the children back in school, the snowman melts. Corn's been gathered, the scarecrow tends the pumpkin field with the autumn moon. Corn's been gathered, the scarecrow falls with the autumn wind. Smiling Buddha, the open palm full of autumn rain. Bitter cold, my aunt wearing her dead son's coat. Winter night, my landlady peers at a bill in the at a bill in the moonlight. Spring breeze, the sow grunts at dogwood petals falling in the trough. He is dead, only the autumn wind flipping through his music book. Drifting autumn clouds, being told of his death, words fly off like birds. Spring breeze, and on the old cat's grave, the new grass sprouts. Winter come, winter's come, horse at the stable tossing snow from his mane. Thank you. Thank you, Helen Coleman. Thank you. And now, yeah. Uh, Laurie, are you ready? Or would you want to wait? Okay. <laughs> Will you? Uh huh. Will you join me, please, in welcoming Laurie Schuldener? This one is called Natural Injustice. 
what? Natural injustice. When the dreams are washed away, there's little left to say, for no one's left to play with kindness gone astray. Quiet becomes the night, and the moments are never quite right. Darkness overpowers the light, no energy's left for the fight. It's all been part of a sordid scheme, and all of the things are not as they seem. The members disband, no longer a team. As I concede to God, life is not but a dream. The second one is called, Not a Day Goes By. Not a day goes by, Daddy, never goes by a day that I don't think of you and how you left us on that day. The 30th of April, with Ne Tisha Shanim, when the spring was giving way to summer somewhere, as was the scheme. You left not of your own volition, or perhaps you knew but could not say just what events would sure transpire on that productive, active, spring-born day. You're graying. The garage door needs some oil. You're graying. I'm growing. To you, I was a little girl. How does it feel? Good evening. Good evening. All right. Good. Um, I enjoyed hearing the poetry so far, uh, but one thing is missing out of all the poems that I've that I've heard, and that is poetic license. So I brought mine. <laughs> and this poetry reading is sponsored to you by a group called the Society for Poets of Southern New Jersey, of which some of us are here tonight. Ballad of Lester and Esther Sylvester. Now, believe it or not, there is someone walking around the streets of Philadelphia with the name of Esther Sylvester. She used to be an dis assistant district attorney, and one day listening to the radio, I happened to hear her name, and I had to do something with that. And I had the name Lester. And here we go. Into the room walked Lester Sylvester. On the bed was his naked sister, Esther. He tried to pester Esther and incest her, but Lester incensed her, and Esther did fester. I'm nobody's jester. I will have you sequestered. And Lester Sylvester, her words not found in Webster. <laughs> How many of you can relate to this here? I can't get rid of my bills. They just give me the chills when my money runs low. I don't know where to go. I looked into my savings and here are empty cravings. I turned to my piggy bank but found it has been drank and searched my checkbook to find the money I already took and reached for my credit card. To stay under my limit is very hard. I will call my old, I will call my friend the old bloke. It turns out that he too is broke. <laughs> How many of you have uh, a twin? A twin brother, a twin sister? Nobody? Well, I have a twin. Except I call my twin my ugly twin brother. My ugly twin brother. While seeing myself in a looking glass, suddenly my familiar face started to pass. My features began to wither, replaced by a face, much transfigured. And lo and behold, I began to see strange aspects of my personality. Although I've been blessed with a nice outer skin, never in my dreams did I think what lies within. That day the mask dropped down, the smiling exterior replaced by a frown. Even Dr. Jekyll had hid his Mr. Hyde. Drinking that potion, his true self came outside. But Mr. Hyde was ugly and he did much wrong. What do you think is my ugly twin's theme song? Mm -hmm. To protect myself, I keep him under lock and key in order that he will not harm nor frighten me. He is caged up in my mind. The key lies somewhere he won't find. But wait, there's a rumbling in there. Can it be? Did he really dare? 
I hear a twinge. I hear a pout. Oh my God, my ugly twin has gotten out. Into the mirror, I saw him last. I broke it, but he was too fast. His fleeting glance was too quick for me. I vowed to catch him, breaking every glass, you see. I must find him wherever he would roam, and take his hand and bring him home. Stranger, this story, I tell you, is not absurd. This you must take my word. If you would just give me your looking glass, I would just smash it. On Browning, written 12th grade, 22 years ago, something like that. Poetry, 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 it surely will be the death of me. You may call him a poet or a bard, but please don't tell me. He isn't hard. Browning was good, I venture to say, but his, not, his works are not of the present day. He is boring, he is stiff. However, he would be good if you put his crazy lyrics to a bongo beat, wiggle your shit your hips and shake your feet then he might be good ha ha a lyric love cha 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 <laughs> let's build a chain of those who care you asked how to pay me back you got it off your chest I helped you to return to the track when you were down and depressed you will pay me back many fold when if you follow this advice. Do unto others so I've been told, and will return to you, thrice. Lift your hand to help another person who has fallen down. Show your concern for your brother, and you will wear a royal crown. Let's build a chain of those who care to bring others to the light. I never forget that I was once there, in the darkness of the night. A hand reached out through a friend when I didn't know which was up. All seemed like it would never end, but the words have filled my cup. Pass on to another a good deed to someone in distress. Spare the time to fill the need and bring them happiness. As I helped you to find your way, through words of wisdom, I pray. As I helped you to find your way, I hope you'll pass along. Through words of wisdom, I pray you help to right the wrong. I never know when I may fall again and need someone to care. It's nice to know if and when that someone will be there. Okay. Well, sure one. Yeah. Sweet nectar. If your cup runs over from the sweet nectar I give, then search out for another whose cup is empty and fill their cup with nectar until it overflows. Perhaps one day my empty cup will be filled and overflow from the cup of one you helped to fill. Thank you. Thank you, David Steinberg. And put your zip card on here, David. Oops. Please. Now, I'm going to take a very quick, short break. I said there's absolutely no problem. You show up, you sign up, and you do the best job you know how. Thank okay. you. A lot of the poetry that I read, I term it conceptual poetry because it's thoughtful and <clears throat> you can take it as a human lesson sometimes. Okay, the four poems that I decided to read to you, I put in this order because I thought it would have some way of blooming for you. The first one is titled Laugh at Life. Laugh, Mr. Clown. Life's a joy. Hidden memories of a book. Never written because of time. Placed somewhere atop a hook. Time progressing with endless days. 
tactics used are still amusing. Reaching out in love to one. Some things are precious, too precious to lose. So laugh, sir clown. Make the children laugh. They know not what I speak or live their lives without a staff. Maybe everyone should be a clown. Take life as a joke. Pay when time elapses, turning out to be a hoax. The second poem is titled, Did I? It takes some people a lifetime to see things the way they really are. But then, it's too late to say, did I make the right decision? Did I fall when I should have stood up? Did I have courage to deal with reality? Did I make every effort to find myself? Did I see many of the things people just couldn't see? Did I ever close something out by claiming I couldn't deal? Did I ever wish I was a child again without a care? Did I ever cry when no one was around? Did I ever feel things couldn't get any worse? Did I ever reach for a friend and there was none to be found? Did I ever love and love the feeling? Did I ever claim to be someone that I'm not? Yeah, it doesn't take much to utter superficial bullshit and claim I don't have to, thinking time's on your side, because the hour does come to be late <coughs> and no other question matters but did I? <coughs> third poem is titled First New England Snow. First New England Snow, yet disappointed with four inches and time on my hands, no fields to run through, but like singing in the rain, dancing, prancing, watching it fall, covering, mothering, everything in sight as if it were Christmas Eve, just days away, down the street, by the bank clock. This one is entitled, Objective, to live the life of love. To see the world when time is free, to educate and move comfortably. The big times in a scope of reality. Wind blown in my hair, riding free. Knowledge of the mind of man. Money in my pocket to take my stand. In a world full of chaos, vastness of land. A symbol of a woman fully in command. As fate would have it, or the Lord himself, settle down for the union of two. Take a long lost child unto myself. What else can a woman do? Okay, that's what I had decided. I think I will read En enchanted is one that I wrote when I was um, 
here in Philadelphia. And I was ex I was experiencing something unique. Getting chosen to participate in episodes of disguise. Mental patients calling the deluges of their spheres. All in surroundings taking place on the cliffs of the Appalachians. Yet, 2MS Temple University Hospital. Less than a week of no psychosis, no neurosis. Only the spirits of New Year's, old Lang Syne, shuffling about, making headway for only themselves, so it appears. Another view of Broad Street. Tioga, a sketch away. The weather would do me good if only these schedules would allow me to do such. Rhyming, diming, timing, whining, these fascades of memoirs, these pictures of my yesterdays. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burnett. And now, Charles Goldstein. I see Camden is well represented <coughs> here. This is vodka. Vodka is the one on the left. Gotta kill some time somehow. Oh god, people are here. I'm an old fashioned poet. Poet, are you? Uh, rhyme. Serenity. <laughs> Pardon? I know it is, that's the way I write. You sit upon a reef of stone, a buried island in the sand. Deceived by life, you are alone, sharing the silence of the land. Shadowless sun, a glowing seed, rise on sea so mute and still. No breezes touch the willowy reed, nor kiss the flowers on the hill. No birds aloft, none in the hedge, nothing stirs in the air so thin. As you seek the distant edge, the quiet rises in the silent din. A sense of love, your mind serene, feels no kin to loneliness. For in this peaceful, solemn scene, you share with God a holiness. A girl told me this. Teen years, 1970. I was only 12 when I learned to screw. Man, I really thought it was a great thing to do. When I turned 13, I joined the rat race, defying crazy colors and floating out of space. 14 was a year I was thrown out I was thrown out on my ass for using speed, pills, and plenty of grass. Just past 15, it was easy to sleep around. I stayed with some kids and an old man I found. Finally got hitched, tied a knot at 16, because I was just tired of the same old scene. 17, that's when I haunted the bars. Drank plenty of beer, dug those rock stars. 18, the men knew I could please. They came around for some wild orgies. There I was at 19 with a baby to tie me down. None of my boyfriends wanted to come around. When I touched 20, things weren't going so right. Believe it or not, I never learned to read or write. And here I am at 21. You know I've done it all. Can't see where I'm going. Just keep climbing the wall. Okay. Let's go, Michelle. She stands beneath the towering trees, unties her hair into the breeze, listens to the wandering bell softly call, Michelle, Michelle. With timid steps beside the wood, this shy young, shy young miss, so sweet, so good, hears the flowing water in the dell, sing this song, Michelle, Michelle. She quickly treads upon the emerald way to reach home, before the dying day. 
stops to sip the wishing well as the breeze sighs. A shell, a shell. The evening dust rises quick and sure without this child so kind, so pure. And while the church bells toll farewell in somber tones, a shell, a shell. The townsmen search both far and near to find this lass who was so dear. And when they near the wishing well, the wind moans, a shell, a shell. And so the disappearance of that mist who had ever known a lover's kiss became the dark shadow that befell a crown, a town that cries, a shell, a shell. Um, a very good friend of mine died in an automobile accident in Florida that I wrote for uh, in her memory. Farewell, little flower. Once you played among the stars, breathed wild with excitement, spilled laughter into the wind. Once you gathered dreams to your bosom, fear the thunderous echoing storm, listen to the whisper of tears. Once you were a little lost flower, blossoming briefly to glow in a shimmering bouquet of my life. And now your beauty is eternal leaving a hollow, shadowed void and a silence I shall hear forever. Then on the first anniversary, I wrote this one, uh, of a death. Flower Garden. I shout at the rose, the geraniums in rows. I slash at the flurry of leaves as I hurry to the tryst I must keep where my love lies. She'd often share the hours among these lively flowers, hiding the torment in her mind while I loved her, sweet and kind, with seven days in laughter, dreaming dreams of forever after. I wander slowly to our lake, whose mirrored waters now opaque, show again her glowing self, like a portrait on a shelf, to weep and wail as I stand, with faded blossom in my hand. Uh, your gentle smile I dreamt of your gentle smile that touched my heart chased the winter's chill to bring sweet spring I waited you hurried as the crisp snow serenaded your foot swaying limbs bowed and waved as you passed eagerly overhead in the star-gemmed sky, the moon peeked over a cloud and kissed your face once more. From my lonely window perch, your gentle smile touched my heart. I sighed with love and waved. Uh, let's call Hidden Child. The worn and wind-shaven stone with a name shadowed by the sun, marks the crib of spittered wood that holds a soul of gentleness who never knew the age of three. And we shall never hear her music or know the sweetness of her dreams, nor glide in the harmony of her step. Still, through the eons that may be, her niche will sail in memories. Thank you. Goldstein. Next, we're going to welcome Jan Podolsky. Yeah, Jay. Jay? Yeah. That's funny. That's the funniest looking Y I ever saw. It looks like an N. Huh. <clears throat> Whatever. Good luck. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> this is my first reading in Philadelphia for a number of years because I, um, I've been living in Israel for the last six. Uh, I the Waiting. In thee, there is a particular comfort. 
Every evening, I drown in you. Humanity has savored your honeyed lips for centuries. You are the act of waiting for a pretended lover, for the Messiah, for salvation, for one truth. In waiting, I derive a certain security obtained from the knowledge that thou shall not come easily to me. In waiting, lacking the one truth, in ignorance, unchanged, I remain with hope. The earth sings to me. In desert time, through swirling sands, the earth sings to me, calling me from her bowels in sirened voices from these chalky cliffs under every silent stone. Her voice reaches to my mind's eye. I see her whole as one. The earth sings to me in a voice void of time, of suffering generations in tones of brown, for she is warmed by the blood, red, for she is the blood, life alive and breathing, her voice stringing on every breeze, evident in every dawn. I hear her choir as one. Her song as white, as pure and clean as the desert, green and fresh as the northern hills, it is a lust-filled song. It burns and scars those that let her enter, burning as the sun's rays burn, caramel, violet, on these mountains. The earth sings to me a song of longing, hope for air to cleanse, for rains on thankful lands. In desert time, through swirling sands, this land, here, the earth sings to me. The Exhibition. The painter and her still lifes, catching not moments fleeting, but powers seated around us, available but often overlooked. All paintings are stills, and yet by some I am moved to joy, hunger, amusement. Through my painter's net, I am sieved as flour, I am bread, wine, a wrinkle on a tablecloth. The painter, her essences, her colors, her tones. I am her still life. I am still. Lebanon, 1982. The fifth day, the sixth night. War for peace and oral well rings loud. Mess hall meal. Apricot pits in the tomato salad. Soldiers attacking cooked chicken pieces with ferocity. My hands are steady. My mind spins with the effects of the all but numbing radio announcements. No one to turn to, to beg, let me do something. Soldiers sucking the marrow from the bones, grease dripping from collective chins, the apricot pit in my throat. I can't scream what I already know. An old woman whispered, Men love war. They love it. And until they learn to hate war, there'll be no end. And the soldiers suck the marrow of non-existent bones. <laughs> Trying to remember the heat's got me down, like a dog on all fours, panting and drinking muddy water puddles of last week's rain. Tonight's full moon scratches the tide's back. He stretches out and licks the breakwater, leaving an infinitely long grin along the sea. Grandpa would walk with me on nights such as these, by the breakwater, down under the pier, watching waves roll down this royal corridor of weathered wood beam supports, which never moved to Neptune's chagrin in high tide or violent storm. Now Grandpa's gone, 
pier has been torn down. The cool, reflective character of the sea has taken on properties of stagnant water puddles in summer's heat. I sit here on this humid, brown beach, alone but for the moon, digging deep this sand hole to China, trying to remember what Grandpa would say. And maybe one last one, maybe a little funny. <clears throat> okay. On sloshing. The rainmaker must be a fool, sick or slick, too old or young, too drunk or high up there. Down here we slosh around wet to the socks. An organized drizzle at 3 a.m. wouldn't do. All day, Saturday, Sunday, he'll rain on you. Buckets. There's a 10,000 year supply, and now it's all coming down. Shut the shutters, light the fires, and dry your socks. The rainmaker got a hangover. Thank you, Jay Podolsky. Thank you, Herschel. My pleasure, and I hope all of yours as well. We have two more, so bear with me. Lisa Naomi Konigsberg. It's all yours. And if you don't read the one that I read, I'll bring you. I know. These aren't my pajamas. These aren't, these aren't my pajamas. I just came from work and never mind. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I put it last. Wait a second. Where is it? Here it is. <clears throat> Womb she was. I dropped from her. Bruised peach. She cradled what I was, finally, 